So it's a, it's a great pleasure to have Nick Tapon here tonight. Uh, so Nick is a group leader at the very brand new institute, the Crick Institute here in London. And uh, his lab is interested in understanding what controls cell proliferation and growth during the development of an organism. So in other words, um, how, how the cells that form our body know when Stop growing and proliferating, and I guess that's what it's going to look like. Sorry, George. Okay, so, so any, uh, at any point in the talk, you can, you can actually in interrupt and ask any questions that you have. I'm not actually guaranteeing that I can answer them because a lot of these things I'm going to talk, I've tried to keep it very general and cover a lot of grounds really uh, into the fascinating uh, subject at hand today, which, uh, as you all know, is uh, all creatures great and small, so we're going to spend the next three hours discussing this wonderful uh, TV series uh, from the BBC based on the, uh, the James Harriet novels uh, of, the, of the same name, which is focused on the life of uh, three vet veterinary uh, surgeons living in, in rural uh, Yorkshire, and a, a very memorable uh, TV series that I'm sure you'll uh, you'll, you'll all have no, I'm actually just kidding. Uh, we're not going to talk about all creatures great and small. I, ju I just thought I'd show my age by showing you that this TV, which, uh, TV series which was shot, shot, shot at the end of the 70s is actually something that I'm familiar with, uh, that I've seen some episodes of myself. Uh, but uh, it, as, as, uh, as lovely as uh, All Creatures great, great and Small is, we will actually talk about growth yeah. control. So, uh, so that is, a, you know, this is represented by this uh, too small uh, picture here. I just couldn't draw a hippopotamus myself because uh, it's, uh, it's too, too sophisticated for my limited writing skills and uh, my, my, my limiting, uh, limited uh, drawing skills and will be exposed, I'm afraid, to my limited drawing skills throughout the season. I've got some beautiful pictures uh, which I can give away at the end of the talk if anybody's interested in <laughs> sponsoring my arts career. Okay, so I'll introduce myself. I'm, I'm actually French, as you can probably hear. Uh, I've been here for a long time, so I actually did my bachelor's degree at Imperial College in London and then I did my PhD at UCL. The University College London, and I moved to the States for a few years to study. Uh, uh, to, well, I to I'm interested in the problem of growth control, and particularly uh, these fruit flies, uh, Drosophila melanogaster, as a model system to, to study this fascinating question. Then I came back to France for a couple of years and decided that uh, you know, the weather is just. Uh, I was in Nice actually, in the south of France, and I decided the weather in, in, in England was so unforgettably good <laughs> that I would move back to, uh, to the UK, and this is where I've been. Uh, for the past uh, like four years or something like that now uh, at the uh, former Cancer Research UK London Research Institute, which is based over here at Lincoln's, Lincoln's in Fields, and now uh, moving to the Francis Crick Institute, which is actually such a new institute that it doesn't actually exist yet. <laughs> in fact, we're moving into our new facility at King's Cross, uh, St. Pancras area, in a, in a few months' time, and we're very excited about that. So, Introductions being over, let's let's see where we are here because I don't really. So we're trying to understand essentially how, how tissue size is controlled. And this is a, a fairly big problem. An embryo or an egg is a very small, uh, a very small structure, and an adult organism like this hippo is a very large structure. So in order to go from one to the other, we need to control uh, proliferation, growth during development very precisely to get an animal which is exactly the right size, not too big and not too small. And uh, as, you, as, you, as, you, as you know, um, there is a massive variety of, of sizes and shapes in living organisms throughout our planet, and therefore understanding how from a very small set of, of genetic instructions we can generate, or the, the, the living beings can generate such a variety <coughs> of shapes and sizes is actually a very fascinating and, and interesting topic to study. So but before we move on to that, uh, I just want to make sure that everybody understands a few basic concepts because I've tried to keep the talk very, very general, so that it, well, I'm not assuming a lot of knowledge from, from, uh, from you guys. But obviously, if anything's not clear, and if you're not clear with a particular concept, then let me know and I will, uh, I will, I will explain further. So the first concept to be clear of is, is everybody happy or raise your hand if you, if you don't know that the body is made up of cells, so that those are individual units. Uh, of our bodies, no? Everybody's okay with that? And inside the cell, there's a particular small <coughs> structure here called the nucleus, and that nucleus contains our DNA, our genetic material, and that genetic material, DNA, is the blueprint that tells our cells how to behave. It's directing you know, all of the behavior, <coughs> not only of individual cells, but also of populations of cells, telling them what to do. So that's 
and the, the, the DNA is broken up into different genes, which are its different units, and each of those genes uh, is, a, is a small set of instructions for a small set of behaviors in our cells. So is that with me, with me so far? Good, good. So in terms of regulating the growth of an animal, what we have to think is mostly two, two processes. Well, that's, those are the two processes that really we're going to focus on today. The first one is cell division. So the cells, uh, an animal can grow by essentially generating more cells. And that's uh, done by a process called cell division or proliferation, where a single cell divides into two to give rise to two daughter cells. So that's the first, the first growth process. The other process that can happen is that the cell can not divide, but it can grow in size and therefore become bigger, and that's cell growth. And we're going to talk about both of these, these, uh, these things today. Uh, and we're, we're not going to talk about cell death, which is another aspect. Cells don't live forever, they actually can die, and that also obviously matters for, for the control of, of, uh, of animal cells. Okay, so hopefully you're, you're, you're still with me for, for, for the moment. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the basic question of growth control. So this is where the, um, I mean that, that's still kind of okay, but then the drawing uh, quality really, really drops down. <laughs> so I'm afraid I'm letting myself down. So okay, that's the life cycle, the very schematized life cycle of a human. And you, you guys all, all probably know this, so there's no need to kind of go into too much detail. So the, you know, a human begins life as a very small cell called the egg, which is present inside the mother. Uh, and this egg is fertilized by the sperm, which is the male gamete, as shown here. And uh, this, uh, this egg is actually growing inside the, the, mother's, uh, the mother's belly, as shown here. And it's fed by the mother completely. It has no ability to consume food by itself, obviously, because it's, it's trapped inside its mother. And uh, the, this feeding is happening through the placenta, and in particular through the umbilical cord, which delivers all of the, uh, the nutrients from the mother to the fetus. Uh, then uh, the, 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 uh, the fetus, or the, the, uh, um, the child to be, grows. And then eventually it decides that uh, it and the mother decide that it's grown enough and birth actually happens. So birth happens after a, a set period of growth, which is called gestation, and it's different in different, uh, different animals, as you will see. So at birth, uh, we get a small child, hopefully a happy child that doesn't cry too often for the, for the, for the uh, pregnant uh, couple in the audience. But the child growth is not finished for that child. Uh, a lot of the growth actually happens up to puberty, so the, uh, the infant is actually very small, and, and in order to become an adult, it needs to increase in size by quite a large, quite a large degree. And so that that is a very intense growth period until uh, the, uh, the, the the child reaches sexual maturity, and that's a process called puberty, whereupon it stops growing, except uh, sometimes growth takes place in, in places where you wouldn't necessarily have to take place, alas. Uh, but by and large, the adult remains roughly the same, same size. The adult is, is sexually mature and is able to produce its own gametes and start the cycle all over again. So when we're talking about growth control in animals, we're really trying to understand how growth is controlled during in the, in the mother's uh, belly, but then also afterwards during the, uh, the, the puberty, pre pubertal growth period. So that's what we're going to talk to uh, a little bit about today. Our second, uh, let's say, a place where we're going to talk about growth control is my favorite organism, the fruit fly. Uh, so no, that's not a bumblebee, that's actually a fruit fly. Uh, so fruit fly have been used for many years, uh, as a, you know, for actually over 100 years, as a, as a genetically tractable system to, in which you study all sorts of things from uh, you know, the way genes behave. Actually, the concept of genes was actually worked out in fruit flies by Thomas Hunt Morgan in the early 1900s. He got the Nobel Prize for that discovery that genes are the, uh, the kind of the basic set of instructions uh, that allow a transmission of characters from one generation to the next. Uh, but we can also use them to study growth control because they have their own life cycle and they undergo their own very precisely regulated growth program. Uh, so that's the adult uh, uh, And the female lays an egg, which is fertilized. She actually stores sperm inside her, uh, inside her body. Uh, out of the egg comes uh, the, the equivalent of a, of a, pubescent, a prepubescent child uh, in the fly, which is the larva. So the larva, larval stages are actually, are actually three in fruit flies in, in Drosophila, uh, one, two, and three larval stages. And these are separated by molts. The animal grows, and it needs to shed its exoskeleton in order to grow uh, bigger, just like, like, uh, like a snake. 
so at the end of the third level in star, uh, the third level stage, it actually decides, uh, okay, that's enough, I've grown enough, and now I can actually afford to transform into an adult uh, organism. And that's really that transition from this kind of uh, uh, pubescent stage to, the, uh, to the, the, the beginning of the adult phase. Uh, that a lot of people are studying. So just like butterflies, flies undergo full metamorphosis, so they, they become immobile and they deteriorate, so they completely transform from a, a maggot, essentially, into an adult fly that's kind of active wings and, and all these life structures. So we're going to talk about both of these, these models because we really, a lot of the things that we understand about how growth, how science is regulated, uh, is, is, uh, is from, from work in both in mammalian systems but also in, in fruit flies. Okay, now once we've reached adulthood, actually our troubles aren't over because it's actually hard work to stay the same size, surprisingly enough. Our cells die all the time inside the body, particularly the tissues like the skin and, uh, and the, the lining of our, our intestines where they're exposed to food and other insults. Uh, and so they, those cells die all the time and they have to be replaced constantly in order to keep us the same, same, uh, same uh, size. And in fact, and keep us functioning. So in fact, uh, many of the, of the, the signals, uh, the communication that's involved in size regulation during development, uh, during these stages, are also reused for the same purpose during adult life to keep us functioning properly. And that's a process called regeneration of our tissues, for example. So, okay, so why do we study size control? Well, if you look around you, you know, at, at the, the diversity of different animal and plant species, you can, you can very easily appreciate that size control is a very fascinating problem because as I said, you know, actually, um, uh, the whale genome is, is extremely similar to the, uh, to, the, to the mouse genome, which is very similar to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the human genome, for example. So all these species are actually rather similar if you just look purely at their DNA, DNA sequence of the, the blueprint of their lives. So it's only very subtle differences that actually uh, determine these massive changes in tissue size and also tissue shape. So it's really a very fascinating pro you know, uh, process to actually understand how this diversity is generated from a very, very small set of signals and, and communication. Uh, the other, of course, uh, uh, reason to study growth control is disease. I mean, as we know, there are many diseases of growth, in particular gigantism and dwarfism, which are where uh, people are uh, taller and smaller than, uh, than uh, 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 the average. Uh, but also the biggest growth disease, of course, as you know, is cancer. Because in cancer, the cells in our body become selfish, and they start to ignore the instructions that tell them, no, don't proliferate, you don't need to proliferate, and they start to proliferate uh, out of control and start to form growth. And so we're hoping that by understanding really how growth control is regulated during development, we can understand how cancer actually occurs. So let's talk about growth control. So. <laughs> the first question we should ask ourselves, actually, I've been telling you that uh, these animals are very precisely controlled in their growth pattern or their overall size, but actually, is that true? Am I telling you a lie? And in fact, let's ask ourselves, are all species uh, actually uh, you know, of, a, of a determined size? Do they reach, by, by the end of their, their development period, do they reach a predictable size? Well, actually, it's not, it's not entirely the case. Uh, in fact, this is a question that's, that's very interesting. Uh, and, and, and we know that if, if we look throughout the, 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 the tree of life, many species are actually of indeterminate size. That's the term that's, that's being used. So their size is not actually completely set. They can grow throughout their lives. Obviously, their size is limited by their lifespan. Eventually, they die, become old and die. They, they, will, um, they, they will grow throughout their, life, their, their lifetime. So that's called indeterminate growth, as I said. And in fact, many, many species are like that. So I'm thinking about plants. Of course, plants can grow throughout their lifespan. But also many species of fish can do that as well. And in fact, if you look, so this is uh, going to insects, a very interesting uh, uh, category of, of animals. If we look at insects, in fact, different um, um, species of insects have either determinate or indeterminate growth. So this is a tree of life for insects. And we're looking here. These are the most kind of primitive insects like uh, these are animals like the silverfish here, for example, so these are very primitive insects. And we're looking at more evolved insects like the butterfly. Of course, the beautiful but butterfly is one of the more sophisticated insects. Uh, so these two, uh, these two um, kind of, uh, 
sets of species of, of, uh, of insects are actually of indeterminate growth. They'll grow throughout their lifespan. However, the more evolved species of insects are actually of determinate growth. They will reach a specific size and stop there completely. So what we can say is that actually the acquisition of a determinate, determinate size, a limited size, is actually something that's evolved relatively late. And we think, or people think in the field, that it's evolved in order to, uh, to be able to make animals that are more complex. Because you can imagine if you have a very, very complicated brain, like our brains, for example, it's actually very, very difficult to keep it growing throughout the lifespan while keeping it functioning properly. And so an evolution of complexity has essentially brought with it uh, this determinate size, this keeping, keeping the same size. So it is a very frequent trait among many organisms. Obviously, uh, uh, mammals are of determinate size, but it's not universal. Okay, so my little group sheet here. Uh, so okay, so where do we start when we talk about when we want to talk about growth control? I told you both in flies and in, in humans and in, in, in other species, the starting point is the egg or the oocyte. That is the first cell that you start with, and then all of the cells of the results are generated here. So the first question that's legitimate to ask when we're looking about how science is controlled is. Do big animals have bigger eggs than small animals? And you know, if you think about birds, for example, well, a chicken egg is, is, uh, is, is actually much smaller than an ostrich egg. Ostrich eggs are enormous. Uh, so actually, let's look at this here. And what you should be able to see from this high quality drawing here is that this is not the case. So there is no uh, kind of definite relationship between the size of the egg or of the oocyte and the final size of the animal. So if you look at uh, this uh, mink whale uh, egg, it's about 120 micrometers, so it's a very small cell um, uh, in, in, in diameter. This mouse egg is about the same, it's about 70 to 120 uh, micrometers. Whereas the adult mink, mink whale is about 7 to 8 uh, tons, and the adult mouse is of course about 19 grams. Uh, so there is no relationship really between the size of the egg and the final size of the animal. Surprisingly enough, so in fact, this this uh, adult mouse is 370,000 times lighter than the adult uh, whale, but they start from more or less the same starting. So we have to look elsewhere for our difference in, in size. Now, the second question we can ask: Well, what about all the other cells in these animals? You know, is the mink whale actually bigger because it has bigger cells than the uh, than the adult mouse? So a few years ago, I would probably have told you like no. Not at all. The, the adult mink whale cells are exactly the same size as the adult mouse cells. But actually, that's not quite true. There are some cells, like fat cells, for example, or brain cells, that are actually bigger in the mink whale than they are in the, in the mouse, for example. But the majority of cells, particularly fast dividing cells, are actually the same size. So it's certainly the, the size of the cell, doesn't, just like the size of the, uh, the, uh, the original egg cell, doesn't actually explain the difference in size between these two animals. Uh, so we have to move on to the next to the next thing. So we're still looking for something which is different between these di very differently sized animals, which is going to you know, tell us you know, why the mouse is smaller than the whale. Uh, so the next thing we need to look at is uh, well, does it you know <clears throat> if they start from the same starting point, then it's obvious to think that does it actually take a shorter amount of time to make a mouse? Than it takes to make a way. Well, that uh, seems to be the case. So that is illustrated here. So by and large, the time, the gestation time of smaller animals is shorter than the gestation time of longer animals. They stay inside their, their mother's tummies for longer period of time. So our little mouse here takes about 20, 20 days to develop, and it's about 19 grams. Uh, the, the human, uh, which is about 60 kilo on average, takes about 260 days to develop, and the elephant, which is 5 ton, takes a whopping 640 days to develop. So, by and large, there is a relationship. However, you can see that that relationship is not perfect, because this lion here, which is heavier than the human, actually takes 108 days. So there is a complex relationship between gestation time and, uh, and uh, the, the, the final size of the, of the animal. By and large, a longer gest gestation time will make a, longer, long, a bigger animal. Gestation is in the womb. Yes, in the womb. But these are the weights 
<coughs> of the mature species, absolutely. Not, not when they're born. Yeah, so puberty is also longer in these animals, which explains part of the difference, and we're going to talk about puberty next. Yeah. So that's certainly part of the explanation. The other kind of... Yeah. So how do we say it's lying? <laughs> I'm afraid I do not have that data, <laughs> but, but yes, it is, it is proportionally smaller than the, uh, oh, than the elephant. Yeah. <laughs> uh, compared to the human, I don't have that data, I'm afraid, but then, yes, it does make sense. It takes, it will take longer to, uh, to, to undergo maturation. Yeah. Uh, actually, no, it won't take longer to undergo maturation, but it, it grows faster. Than, than humans on average. So line is bigger than Yes, absolutely. So the growth rates are not the same. I mean, that, that is the, uh, that is the that's essentially the difference, is that growth rates are different, both in utero, inside the mother, but also outside the mother. That depends on many things, diet, for example. In the mother, what matters a huge amount is actually the cross-section of the umbilical cord, because if you have a bigger cross-section in the umbilical cord, as all of the nutrients go through the umbilical cord, you will be able to feed your, your, your growing fetus much faster than an animal with a smaller umbilical cord. And then other things that matter besides the diet and, and the umbilical cord uh, uh, section is the blood pressure of the mother, for example, because the more blood it's able to actually exchange uh, nutrients with the, with the, uh, the, the fetus through the placenta, the more uh, the, the, the fetus is going to grow fast. So there's a lot of, of factors that actually uh, you know, are, you know, uh, are different between different species in terms of the rate of growth. But by and large, if you take longer to develop, you'll be bigger and you can take a shorter amount of time to develop. So that's, uh, so that's one, of the, one of the conclusions. Okay, so we've got at least one difference, uh, that, uh, or, or one, one aspect of, of growth control, which is determining uh, how, how, um, how big an animal grows. So obviously the question becomes, how is gestation time controlled? So uh, when, does the, uh, when do the mother and, and fetus actually decide when it's time for the baby to be born? So that's a very important point that is very important for growth control and also for you know, uh, parents, I guess. Uh, so, okay, so this is a, a, a blow-up representation of a, of, a, of a human fetus. Again, not very well drawn, I apologize. So you have the baby here. This is the umbilical cord, and this is the placenta, which is the structure that essentially connects to the mother and allows the transfer of food from the mother into the, uh, the fetus through the umbilical cord. And so how is gestation length controlled? So how does that decision get taken that the child has grown big enough that it can actually survive in the real world and, and, and actually can come out? How, how does that actually happen? So this is actually a very complicated subject. And it's, it's, a, it's essentially as a result of a conversation through hormones and different signaling uh, molecules that go through the umbilical cord between the mother and the child and the placenta as well which is a very important part of, of, uh, of, uh, of how babies are born in placenta. Uh, so this conversation is essentially the child says, I'm ready. The mother says, are you sure you're ready? And then uh, the child says, OK. And then the mother says, OK, let's have, let's have the birth. I mean, it's, it, it literally is uh, uh, ex an exchange of different chemical signals between the mother and the fetus. Uh, so in particular, from the point of view of understanding how size, overall size of a, of a, of a human being animal is set, the particular signals that are important to, 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 uh, to think about are, for example, hormonal signals. So during the, the, the life of, a, of the, the fetus inside the mother, its um, uh, nervous system and other organs start to become more sophisticated and they start to become more functional. So for example, there are uh, several glands that are very important for the onset of birth. Um, uh, there's, uh, and, and these glands uh, mature at, through the, the, the life of the, of the fetus. So there's the hypothalamus and the pituitary, which are small glands inside the brain of the fetus. And there's also, of course, um, uh, the, uh, the <laughs> I'm, I'm very good at losing words, the adrenal gland, which is sitting on top of the kidney of the developing fetus. And all of these glands actually produce a variety of enzymes, but in particular cortisol, uh, which is a, a, a birth signal. So over time, as they mature, they start to secrete more and more cortisol until uh, the, the, the mother essentially knows from, from measuring the amount of cortisol inside the, uh, her, her bloodstream that the fetus is actually ready to undergo birth and it's reached the right level of maturity. So that's one 
one of these signals. It's essentially the ticking clock. It's the development of the feature. And then the second uh, kind of signal that people are, are very interested in is simply a mechanical one. As the baby becomes bigger, the, the mother's abdomen becomes more extended, and this stretched signal of the uterus wall is actually thought to be one of the triggers that, uh, through various other uh, signaling molecules, will actually secrete, uh, will actually uh, induce the birth of the, of the child. So it's the size of the fetus itself which might actually be a, a relevant signal for the birth, which is a, a very interesting way of, of, of regulating birth. I think. So, okay. So that basically, the, the birth of the fetus itself is the program that determines when the fetus is going to be born. Uh, so we we've now we now understand more or less how how birth is actually happening, or how birth is, is coupled to, to the growth of the fetus. But of course, as, we, as I told you before, and uh, as you told us, uh, the the, uh, the growth of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the infant is not where growth actually ends. A lot of the growth actually happens during the, uh, the uh, kind of uh, immature stages of animal development until puberty. So, how is that uh, the growth during puberty actually regulated? Well, again, it's very much about an exchange of information between different uh, tissues, different organs within the uh, within the, uh, the young developing uh, organism. Uh, so again, it involves a gland at the base of the brain called the pituitary. And you will know if you've uh, followed like sports, for example, about a protein or a, a particular hormone called growth hormone, very popular with bodybuilders, for example, because it in increases, it can very, uh, inc uh, very strongly increase muscle mass in athletes, for example. And so uh, the pituitary is the main site for secretion of this, of this uh, signal called gro growth hormone. H. So initially, during uh, during early uh, childhood, it's secreted at fairly fairly low levels. But as the uh, as the child matures, growth hormone levels actually increase very fast and they peak uh, during uh, during puberty. And so, what growth hormone does is it goes in particular to the liver, but also to all the other tissues inside the child, and it induces or it it, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it convinces the liver and the other tissue to secrete another signal called insulin-like growth, growth factor, or IGF. And IGF is a very potent growth signal for all of the tissues uh, within, the, uh, within the, the young child. So growth hormone essentially uh, uh, drives the expression of this very potent growth signal, which is saying, grow, 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 and you need to grow faster. OK, so we're trying to. So the, uh, the, the, there are many sites, of course, where IGF is, is, uh, is inducing the, uh, the, the child to grow. For example, the muscles are shown here, but one of the most uh, kind of clear examples is actually in the, uh, in, the, in the bones. Because if you want to make a bigger organism, you need to make, particularly for mammals, you need to make a bigger skeleton. And so bone growth is, is, a, is a very important, uh, is a very important uh, concept if you want to understand how growth actually happens within, uh, within animals. So growth actually happens not throughout the bone, but in a structure called the, the, uh, the, uh, the EGP, or the epithelial uh, growth plate, which is usually present at the end of the bone. So these are the places where new bone material is being added to the bone as it grows. And so these are full of cells that can either proliferate or not proliferate, and whether they, they divide and proliferate or not will depend uh, how, how the bone is actually growing. And so this, uh, this signal, IGF, as shown here, is actually a very potent uh, driver of the, the, uh, the proliferation and the growth <coughs> of these cells, and therefore of the elongation of the bones. So it's very strongly driving this process. Now, uh, so um, it may, many actually forms of, of dwarfism or, or small stature actually involve the perturbation of this axis between growth hormone and IGF. If you don't secrete enough IGF, then you're going to tend to be smaller in stature. And some forms of, of dwarfism are perturbations in the system. And if you secrete too much IDF, you tend to be a giant. So that's one particular aspect of, of bone growth. Now, in terms of understanding how growth is controlled, there's another signal that we can, uh, that we can think about. And that's uh, another protein called the fibroblast growth factor. So we have insulin-like growth factor and fibroblast growth factor. And actually, even though uh, FGF or fibroblast growth factor is actually called a growth factor, 
in the bone, it actually is inhibiting, it's antagonizing, it's preventing IGF from inducing growth of the bone. It's actually inhibiting uh, the growth of the bone. And very interestingly, fibroblast growth, the this, this signal that prevents bone growth is actually mutated in many, uh, many people that actually have a, a form of autism called achondroplasia. So these, uh, these people actually have a mutation in the receptor for this signal, which makes bone growth premature too early before it should, and therefore stops the growth of these bones. And that's why you, they, they, they actually have smaller, smaller heads. Uh, so that's, that, there's a balance between FGF and IGF is therefore very important for controlling the overall size of mammals. And in fact, a very spectacular example of this, this particular thing is in different dog species. So, uh, so this is uh, a picture not to scale because otherwise you wouldn't see the dachshund. So this is the dachshund here on the right, and uh, this is a, a, a Great Dane on the, on, the, on the left. And the Great Dane, as you can see, is much bigger than the, uh, the dachshund, and in particular, the length of its, le of, its, of its legs is extremely different. So the dachshund has very short legs. And in fact, uh, through some very neat genetic work in using different dog uh, species or studying different dog species, their, their genome is very similar between the different dog species, and yet their leg size is, is hugely different. And actually, what the reason for this is in fact a perturbation in this uh, FGF, the uh, fibroblast growth factor signal. These dogs, the dachshunds, actually have an extra copy of the, uh, the this particular signal here, which is expressed at very high levels in the in the bone and therefore terminates their growth very, very early compared with the great length. And in fact, it is the same in corgis, which are the uh, uh, favorite breed of, of the poop. Okay, so, so there's a balance between different growth promoting and growth inhibitory signal and that determines the final, uh, the final size of the, uh, of the animal. Now, okay, so, um, <coughs> So, so obviously the, the, the question is then how is, uh, is puberty, uh, what, what, what triggers the onset of puberty? When does the, uh, the child decide that it's grown enough and it's time to stop, stop actually growing? Because obviously if you're too big, it's, it's not necessarily a good thing. It can be very unhealthy uh, to, to grow for too long. Uh, so we're not you know, completely sure exactly how that happens. One of the main ways in which it could happen is that eventually when the levels of this IGF growth signal actually build up to a, a very high level at the end of puberty, they actually become able to go back to the, uh, to the pituitary and actually switch off the production of growth hormone inside the pituitary. So it's the very highest growth levels that actually are responsible for shutting down growth. And that's a way of, of feeding back and regulating growth uh, through growth itself, which is a very common theme uh, when, you, when you think about growth regulation. Uh, so yes, so that's one, one, possible, uh, one possible solution, or that one definite mechanism for which, through which puberty is, 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 uh, actually happens. Uh, the other mechanism is obviously that uh, very likely it involves sexual, the, the, the child reaching sexual ma maturity, which also participates in, in, in regulating growth hormone levels. Uh, so uh, let's go back to the fly a little bit. How, how long have we been talking? Uh, I apologize. Uh, you've got five minutes. Five minutes, perfect. Okay, so let's talk about puberty and flies. Uh, so uh, flies don't slam doors and they don't uh, tell their parents they wish they'd never been born, but they do have a form of puberty, which is their, their, their larval stages. Really, the, the infant stages are the, the kind of uh, uh, the, the larval stages, and then puberty is when the animal decides to puberty. Okay, so that decision is essentially done very much in the same way as it's done in humans. In fact, it's done through hormonal signals. So the fly has an equivalent of the pituitary gland, which uh, secretes um, uh, many, many uh, different hormones involved in human development and, and mammalian development. Uh, and that's called the ring gland. It's not actually called the pituitary in the flies. And this particular gland decides by releasing hormones, uh, a particular steroid hormone co called ecdysone, that it's time to actually undergo metamorphosis. It's time to stop growing. Uh, so that's a, there's some very interesting uh, work that's been done by a bunch of groups about how this transition or this puberty in flies is actually regulated. And in particular, we know that if you damage one of these uh, tissues here, so these are 
uh, a small balls of cells which will later give rise to the, to the adult wings of the fly, for example. So they're, they're small balls of cells, and inside the, the larvae, they jo their job is to grow and divide very fast, and then they'll eventually transform into the adult wings. So in fact, we can, using genetic tricks, we can damage them uh, and, and essentially make them disappear. And what will happen when, when they do that is that the, the, the animal will decide, hang on, something's wrong. I actually need to slow down my development so that we can repair the, uh, the, this tissue. Otherwise, we're not going to have any wings, which is not very good if you're a fly. So these damaged tissues actually secrete a signal called dilpate. <coughs> or Drosophila insulin like peptide A, which is actually a, different, uh, a distance relative of, uh, of IGF in, in humans. And this dilpate uh, signal goes back to, the, uh, to the, the pituitary of the fly and tells the pituitary, no, it's not time to, pupa, to, uh, to actually form a pupa, you have to slow down, you have to slow down development, we can't actually do it, I have to repair myself first. So this, is, uh, this takes place both by slowing down the growth of the other tissues, so that they slow down their growth, their growth rates as well, but they also prevent the, this, uh, this fly equivalent of puberty, <laughs> so that the, uh, the, the, the animal can actually repair itself. So that's a very neat way in which uh, the animal is monitoring its size all the time, and if, it's not, if some of its, its organs are not the right size, then it's able to slow down development until it's able to repair. Now, this is one function of this very cool delpate molecules during like, times of stress, when there's something wrong happening in development. But in fact, it's used all the time, because what, you, what people realized when they were studying this, uh, this, this molecule is that uh, all of the different organs of the fly talk to each other all the time in order to compare their growth rate. And in fact, if you mutate or if you eliminate this delpate signal, what happens in the absence of, of a massive damage signal is that the animal starts to have wings that are of different sizes. So its left wing, for example, will be smaller, or uh, it will be bigger than its right wing. And so it's the, the, the gilpate um, molecule essentially allows harmonious development. It allows uh, the, 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 the body to grow in proportion. And we think that uh, equivalent of this, this, uh, this particular signal are actually functioning in, in humans and doing more or less the same thing. So, we're almost done, so I'm going to go very quickly through uh, another signal. Okay, so we, we basically understand quite a bit, I think, about how growth is controlled at the, uh, at the whole organism level by essentially controlling the length of the growth period, so both the length of gestation and also uh, the length of the, the growth period up to puberty in, in different organisms. Now, there are many other, uh, you know, so, and, and as I've told you before, uh, Animals can actually keep the scale of their organisms using some of these signals that actually control these transitions. Uh, but in fact, in some animals, it's not actually desirable uh, for, for, to actually keep your organs of the same size. So I'm thinking about, for example, fiddler crabs, which have one huge claw, at least in males, they have one huge claw and one tiny claw. And that huge claw that they have is used for, for, for uh, mating displays, for example, and also to disperse heat. So sometimes this, uh, this uh, uh, process of, of keeping everything uh, balanced in terms of growth is actually broken. And you can break it by also manipulating the nutrition of, of animals and people. So nutrition is very important to, to control growth. As you, as you probably, if you, if you walk past the school and you see a, a bunch of sixth formers, you probably are thinking, God, they're enormous these days, sixth formers. And they are, in fact. Uh, because as nutrition has become more plentiful in our modern society, which is not necessarily a blessing, by the way, because it brings with it uh, obesity and diabetes, uh, the, the, the size uh, or uh, the, the, the height and, and weight, uh, average weight uh, and height of our population has been increasing in the medieval times when, when people were a lot smaller. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the next kind of very quick story is from one of the darker chapters in human history, and this is the, the, the Dutch uh, 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 hunger winter. So that happened during uh, the Second World War in 1944. The German army was starting to be defeated, and this resulted in cutting up of supplies in Holland to uh, many, many big cities uh, of, of food supplies. And that resulted essentially in, in uh, many people, including pregnant women, 
to be having to get by on only four to eight hundred calories per day, whereas the, the recommended amount for, for a pregnant woman is between two thousand and two uh, and two thousand four hundred calories per day. Uh, obviously, after the uh, the Allies invaded uh, Holland and, and freed the, the Dutch people, uh, people were were obviously fed plentifully again. And so this particular very sad situation is, has been uh, yielding a lot of very interesting information about acute starvation uh, and its effect on, on gestation and on, on fetal growth. Uh, and in fact, what's become clear is that when uh, a mother is, is heavily starved, uh, the, the, um, the, the fetus uh, grows actually more slowly and grows less. But in fact, it sacrifices some of its less essential tissues, like the muscle, the bone, etc., etc., at the expense of really essential tissues like the brain. So you can shrink muscles, you can get by with shorter bones, but if you shrink the size of the brain, you can't function properly. The brain can't actually function properly. That leads to cognitive impairment. And so the, the, the organism knows that it has to, uh, to, to prioritize certain tissues like the brain, and other tissues get sacrificed, which is called sparing. And in fact, in flies, my colleague, colleague Alex Gould at, uh, at the Crick Institute has been able to study sparing, and it happens in a very, very interesting way. We don't really understand fully how it actually works in humans, uh, but in flies, we understand very well how it works. When flies are starved, flies are obviously very sensitive to, uh, to starvation and to, uh, to the effect of the environment. Um, and in fact, um, uh, so. Uh, if, uh, if a fly is starved, it will sense it through its, uh, its fat. The fat is actually, of the fly is actually the sensor tissue that detects that the animal is, is under unfavorable uh, nutrient conditions, so it's being starved. And the fat will actually send a signal to the brain and tell it, we're in trouble, we need to stop growing, we need to stop secreting the IGF equivalent, which again in flies is, is, is driving growth of, of tissues like the muscle, for example. So the fat is sending a signal to the, to the brain, and the brain shuts off or stops secreting this growth signal called the IGF. Okay? And that, then the muscle stops growing. However, the brain is really smart, which makes sense, uh, because in fact, it also relies on IGF for growth, but it also, because it's sneaky, secreting its own pro-growth signal very locally at the very local level, and that allows it to get by. So while uh, the muscle, for example, stops proliferating because it's not receiving IGF anymore, the brain is uh, secreting its own little uh, pro-growth molecule, which is a molecule called the jelly belly, or jelly, uh, which allows it to overcome the effects of starvation. And so that, in, in that way, you're able to protect tissues or allow the growth of tissues that are more important than the, the, uh, the other tissues. It's the ultimate triumph of, of brain overall. So I will get some a few other other things, but maybe uh, I can mention them very quickly, uh, very quickly uh, at, the, at, the, at the end in, in answer to questions. Uh, it's a little bit about how an individual limb knows how big it is. It's actually a fascinating topic, and we can, if you have some questions about that, I can answer them. So hopefully, you know, it's, it's clear that uh, from, from this, uh, this kind of talk, longish talk about growth control, <laughs> what is growth control? Growth control is complicated. It's also extremely interesting because of the diversity of different sizes of organisms. Uh, it's all about timing, really. It's about uh, timing uh, events like, uh, for example, fetus, the growth of the fetus inside the mother, about uh, the onset of, of puberty, for example, in different animals. So it is a lot about timing, uh, like joke. Uh, it's also uh, a lot about uh, communication between different tissues. So remember, talking is important. You need the brain needs to communicate to the muscle. The muscle needs to talk to the... Uh, to, to the liver or whatever. Uh, but most importantly, it's about knowing when to stop. And so, <laughs> <laughs>